Hi everyone, in this next video we're going to cover section 4.7, change of basis. And in this section we go back to coordinate vectors that we were introduced to previously, um, I want to say in 4.5. And um, for the, the to visualize what's going on in this section, um, we'll, we'll take a look at this picture here where we're given a vector x that's described two different ways using two different, uh, two different coordinate systems. So we have x in the image on the left defined in terms of uh, b1 and b2. And so we could say, we could write um, that my vector x is equal to 3b1 plus b2. Or we could even write that with the new notation that we were given, that the coordinate vector for x relative to the basis b is equal to 3 one. That's the vector that 3 is the weight that I multiply by b1, and that the 1 is the weight that, get, that is multiplied by b2 to produce the vector x. Um, but in then, oh, and then in the image on the right, we're given the vector x described in terms of a different basis, uh, a basis c. So we could say that x is equal to, uh, what is it, 6c1 uh, plus 4c2, or to write it more formally, the coordinate vector for x relative to the basis c is equal to the vector 6, 4. But it's the same x in both cases. Um, if it were described relative to the standard basis, it looks like, um, I don't know, it's over uh, maybe uh, 3 or 4 or maybe 6 units to the right and then down 1 unit, probably 6 down 1. Um, and it's and it, In the image on the right, it's the same over and down, right? So it's the same vector described in terms of two different bases. And then in this section, we're looking at, we're looking at the relationship between the bases themselves. So in our first example, we're going to have basis B and a basis C, so two different bases for our vector space V, such that B1 equals 4C1 plus C2, and B2 equals negative 6C1 plus C2. So we're given the basis C in terms of the basis B. We're, we know the relationship between them in this, in this uh, first example, and then we're given X in terms of the basis B, and then the question says find X in terms of the basis C. So how do I take a vector that's in terms of one basis and write it with respect to a different basis if I know the relationship between them? That's what we're looking at. Um, that's what we're looking at here. So what I want to say first is that since the coordinate mapping mapping is a linear transformation linear transformation those two properties that we investigated way back long ago in section like 1.8 applies to this linear transformation so i can write the coordinate vector for x relative to the basis c is equal to uh, let's see 3 b1 plus b2 relative to the basis C. So let's take a look at what I did there. All I did was I took my vector x, or yeah, my vector x, and what it's equal to in terms of b, and I wrote that inside of my brackets, right? So those two things should be equal. If x equals 3b1 plus b2, then its coordinate vector should equal 3b1 plus b2 relative to basis C. But then again, since I made that point about being a linear transformation, I can break that sum up 3 times b1 relative to basis c, I can break the sum and scalars out, plus b2 relative to basis c. And now what I can do is I can take this guy here that's a vector equation, that sure looks like a vector equation, and write it a little bit differently as, oh, I don't know, maybe a matrix equation. So this is the matrix b1 relative to c, and then the second column is b2 relative to C. All that as a matrix times the vector 3, 1. So I'm writing my vector equation a little bit differently as a matrix equation. But now here's the kicker, but let me move this up a little bit actually. I know what B1 is in terms of C. That was given as 4, 1. 
right? That was that equation at the top. That was B1 in terms of C. And I know that B2 relative to C is equal to negative 6, 1. Again, that was the given information. It was uh, B2 equals negative 6, C1 plus C2. So, because I already have that established relationship, the coordinate vector for x oops, relative to the basis C is equal to 4, 1 and negative 6, 1 times 3, 1 times that vector, which is if you do out that multiplication, you should get 6 and 4. So then stepping back and just kind of looking at what we did here, you wouldn't necessarily uh, in practice have to show out all of that work, but we took our B and B1 and B2 in terms of C. Those weights formed this matrix here, and that gets multiplied by the weights of my X vector in terms of B, in terms of basis B, to produce my X vector in terms of basis C. Okay, and now we move into a theorem that kind of talks about that matrix that we looked at in the, the previous example, right? If I have a basis B and a basis C in some vector space V, then there exists a unique matrix, n by n matrix, and we're going to call it this, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, such that the coordinate vector for x relative to C is that matrix times the coordinate vector for x relative to basis B. All right, so talking about that that matrix there. Um, first, it's sometimes called um, a change of coordinates. Change of coordinates matrix. Or just, uh, I will also occasionally say just like a change matrix. All right, and so it's, uh, capital P is used, I'm not sure off the top of my head why it's a capital P, but it's uh, the change matrix from B to C. So we're changing from B to C. And when you look at the equation, the, the order there with the lefty pointing arrow is done intentionally because the B is on the right and the vector, the coordinate vector for X relative to B is on the right. And then the C is on the left and the coordinate vector for X relative to C is on the left there. Okay, so that's why the, the order is done in a really specific intentional way then the columns of that change matrix of the C are the C coordinate vectors uh, of the vectors in the basis B, right? So it's B1 relative to C, B2 relative to C. So I need to know one in terms of the other to, f to write out that matrix. Now I know that the columns, the columns of P from B into C, they are linearly independent because how do I know they're linearly independent they are they are coordinate vectors of a linearly independent set the linearly independent set Okay, uh, so also adding to that, that change matrix P from B into C is square. Let's see if you can figure out what I'm going to write next. They're linearly independent, those the columns, and the matrix is square. So what does that mean about that matrix? Pause for a second. It has to be invertible. It must be invertible. It must be invertible. Um, and then if I take my equation from that theorem that the coordinate vector for x relative to c is equal to p from b into c times the coordinate vector for x relative to b. Um, if I take that equation and left multiply by p inverse, well, what happens there, right? On, on the right-hand side of that equation, you would have P, time, P inverse times P, which would just be, be the identity. So we have the equals just that vector X on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we would have the change matrix from B to C inverse times the coordinate vector for X relative to C. So this is the kind of cool connection here. Since that matrix is invertible and we can multiply by the inverse and all that, well, the inverse times the coordinate vector for 
x over x relative to c produces the the vector x relative to b okay the significance of that is that uh, that change matrix from b to c its inverse is the change matrix from c to b the change of coordinate matrix change of coordinates matrix from B C into B. So when you invert it, you convert it from in, in the other direction, essentially. All right, now in this next example, um, we don't have B in terms of C or C in terms of B. We just have vectors B1 and B2, vectors C1 and C2, and consider the basis for R2 given by B and C. So B and C are our bases, and we need to find the change of coordinates matrix from B to C. Notation-wise, what we're looking for in this example is this matrix, the change matrix from B to C. That's what we're looking for. Okay, but how do we do it if I'm not given one matrix in terms of the other? Well, let's take a look at how this builds. That change matrix involves involves the C coordinate vectors of B1 and B2. So we're going to say let B1 his uh, coordinate vector for relative to C equals some unknown, x1, x2. I don't know what the, the coordinates are in terms of the other one, but I'm just going to represent them as variables. And B2 relative to C is y1, y2. Okay, so then if I take C1 and C2 just as a matrix times x1, x2, that should equal b1. That is essentially what we did in example 1. However, in example 1, I knew what these two things were, and we produced this as an answer. Here we're doing the opposite, basically. Okay, so that would be true. And, and let me go back to black here, uh, c1, c2, c1, c2, times y1, y2 would produce b2 all right and then the awesome cool thing that we'll do to uh solve for x1 and x2 and y1 and y2 is to do that simultaneously and what we can set up is an augmented matrix that looks like this on the left is c1 and C2, those two vectors, and I'll put a little dotted line here. On the right is B1 and B2, those two vectors. We're gonna solve. We're gonna put this uh, this matrix in reduced row echelon form. So we'll get the identity on the left, and what is produced on the right are the x1, x2, y1, y2 solutions. And you can pause and see if you can figure out what's going on here. Maybe you want to do this multiplication out and see how we would set up ultimately the matrix that I have written at the bottom. Okay, so but uh, now to fill in my numbers here, I'm going to go 1, 3, negative 4, negative 5. Let's move back up and take a look where they, those came from. Those are the coordinates of C1 and C2. And then we're going to write down the coordinates for B1 and B2. And let's do that after our dotted line. So the coordinates for B1 and B2 are negative 9, negative 5, 1, minus 1. And just for the fun of it, because I haven't done it in a while, let's do some row operations. Um, rather than just me tell you what, it, what it's equal to, that's, that's not as fun. So let's go. Uh, what's my first row operation? I'm going to multiply row 1 by 4 and add row 2. Row 1 doesn't change. 1, 3, minus 9, minus 5. So 4 times 1, minus 4 is 0. 4 times 3 is 12, minus 5 is 7. 4 times negative 9 is negative 36. Add 1 is negative 35. And 4 times negative 5 is negative 20, minus 1 is negative 21. All right, and what we can see now is my second row is scaled by a factor of 7. So if I reduce or divide that row by 7... 1, 3, minus 9, minus 5, 0, 1, negative 5, and negative 3. 
All right, one more step. I need negative 3 times row 2, and then add row 1. And if I do negative 3 times 0, add 1. Negative 3 times 1, add 3. Negative 3 times negative 5 is 15, minus 9 is 6. Negative 3 times negative 3 is 9, minus 5 is 4. Boom, there we go. So what that all means is that the coordinates of B1 relative to C is that first column on the right, 6 minus 5, and the coordinates for B2 relative to C are is 4, negative 3, the column on the right. Put them together, the change matrix from B to C is equal to 6 minus 5, 4 minus 3. So that's how I change vectors written with respect to the B, uh, B basis and produce vectors written with respect to the C basis. Um, and the beauty of that is if I needed the other direction, if I wanted the other change matrix, all I would have to do is, well, I have two choices right now. I could either flip-flop up here, the C1, C2, B1, B2. If I put B1, B2 first and reduce that, I get the other change matrix in the other direction. Or I take this 2 by 2 matrix here and I invert it. Either of them will produce the change matrix going in the other direction. And that's basically what we're asked to do here in this last example of the section is to find the change matrix in both directions, first from C to B and then from B to C. So we have our bases up at the top. So the previous example, very similar to this one. This one just asks one additional question. For part A, we want the change matrix from C to, ooh, that's a terrible arrow, from C to B. Okay, that's what we want. And the way that we're going to get that is we're going to set up an augmented matrix, dotted line down the middle. Now, um, I didn't emphasize this in the previous example, but which vectors go on the left? Um, I think writing this out is super helpful because not only does it go in that equation that was introduced in the theorem, but it also tells me where my basis vectors go in my, in my augmented matrix. So my C vectors go on the right, negative 7, 9, and negative 5, uh, 7. And my B vectors go on the left, 1, minus 3, minus 2, and 4. Okay, that's my change. That, that will produce the change. So, oh, by the way, it would be incorrect to write equals there. Don't write equals there. The change matrix isn't that whole thing. It's just what's produced on the right when we're in reduced echelon form. So that's what I'll give you next. I'm not going to go through the row operations here, but you end up with 1, 0, 0, 1, and then 5, 3, 6, 4. I'm going across, not down. 5, 3, 6, 4. So then I can say, all right, my change matrix is equal. No, I don't want to write it there. My change matrix is equal to, and this is from C into B, 5, 3, 6, 4. Um, and then for part B, if you want to find the other direction, for part B here, I want the change matrix from B to C. We're going to take P from C into B and invert it. To find the inverse there, we, do, we can use the formula 1 over the determinant, and the determinant is 20 minus 18 is 2, and then... This 4 goes up there, the negative, the 3 becomes negative, the 6 becomes negative, and the 5 goes down there. So remember, these two switch, these two negate. And then when that one's simplified, you get 2, negative 3, negative 3 halves, whoops, halves, and 5 halves. And there's your change matrix going the other direction. Okay, that is the end of the section. Uh, if you have questions, as always, please let me know. Thank you for listening.